Hi guys, this is the ASMR Nerd, and today we're going to be continuing with our soft-spoken reading of Martin the Warrior, a tale in the Redwall series by Brian Jakes. This is maybe a shock to some of you, since, uh, Prior to the, the most recent episode, there was about a year-long break. Um, but uh, I'm trying to stay true to my word and uh, make sure that I'm doing these with at least a bit more regularity. Um, as I always say, if you are joining us for the first time with this reading, I do highly recommend you go back and listen to the previous chapters starting with the prologue that's the first episode um, I've got a playlist on my channel to help you find all those otherwise this won't make a lot of sense but uh, I'm not going to do a recap or anything here because if I did that every time it would become very time consuming indeed so we're just going to start off where we left off, uh, which is at chapter 9. And the picture for chapter 9 is a fish. Provide a little bit of foreshadowing there. So here we go. Dawn brought with it a lull in the battle at Fortress Marshank. The weather was humid and a heavy gray sky hung like a pall with greenish-purple tinges out on the horizon. Badrang stood with Gurid on the wall top. His battle-weary horde ranged along the ramparts, dull-eyed as they ate breakfast and catnapped at their positions. The tyrant stoat noted with grim satisfaction that he had successfully defended Marshank against the Corsair invasion. But Clog was a resourceful enemy. What would his next move be? Oily-looking plumes of smoke rose into the still air from the cooking fires of the Corsairs on the shore. The pirates were in a surly mood. Not only had they failed to breach the gates of the fortress, but they had also suffered the indignity of having their ship gutted by fire and sunk. Captain Traman Clog and several of his messmates were holding an interrogation session behind a semicircular rocky outcrop close to the tide line. The unfortunate Skullrag and six of his remaining archers were the prisoners they were questioning. They huddled together on the beach, cruelly bound paw and muzzle with tough, dried kelp strands. Skullrag stifled a terrified whimper as he stared wide-eyed at the ruthless faces of the sea rats and the vicious twinkle in the eyes of Clog. The pirate stoat drew his cutlass, grinning evilly as he licked the blade and squinted along it toward the quaking fox. Ha <laughs> ha, tell me, Skullrag, what would you do to any beast who set fire to your ship and scuttled her? Skullrag's muzzle was tightly bound. The most he could manage was a strangled sob. Clog swung the cutlass at the petrified fox's head. It clipped several whiskers and neatly severed the gag. Skullrag fainted clean away in a heap. The corsairs laughed uproariously as they doused him with seawater to bring him round. Trom and Clog put the point of his cutlass to Skullrag's nose tip. I wouldn't chop your head off, bucko. Oh no, that'd be too quick for the likes of you. Avast, mates. Tell us scum what we do to ship burners and scuttlers. The corsairs tickled Skullrag with their knife points as they told him. 
String him upside down in a crab pool. Uh, roast him over a slow fire. Chop off his paws and make him eat him. Use him for a baton ram against the forest gate, fortress gates. Oh no, please, Captain Skullrag wailed in despair. Don't let them do it. I was only carrying out Badrang's orders. Clog sat by the fox and stroked his head soothingly. There now, matey. Draw your eyes and don't blubber no more. Old Trauma Clog's got our soft as swans down. I won't let no beast kill you. But Akin now, you must swear on your oath that you'll do exactly as I tell you. Skullrag nodded vigorously. I will, Captain, I will. I swear on my oath as a fox. Trauman chuckled as he patted the fox cheek, fox's cheek tenderly. Of course you will, matey, cause if you don't, the things me crew threaten to do to you will be as nothing to what I do to you when I caught up with you. Listen now, here's what you'll do. Oh, what about them? Skullrag nodded towards his six bound comrades. Traman winked broadly. Oh, don't fret your heart over that lot. Worms like that'll be too much trouble as galley slaves. That'll be fish bait afore nightfall, mate. Skullrag's former archers gave a muted groan of anguish. The slave compound was a circular palisade of upright logs driven into the ground and bound together by ropes. It had a single gate, which was generally kept locked. Inside, the occupants shifted as best they could for themselves. Moles slept on their sack mattresses against the walls, some underneath a rough wooden awning that shaded part of the structure. Oh, sorry, most slept. I don't know why I read moles. At night, the slaves were allowed a fire in the center of the dirt floor. Keela and the rest of the slaves had been on barricade duty all night, piling rubble and rocks against the gates to reinforce them against the battering ram. Now they sat locked inside the slave compound, relieved of quarry and field labors whilst Marshank was under siege. Old Barkjohn shook his head. It's a bad business. If Badrang wins, we'll still be slaves here. However, if the victory goes to the Corsairs, we'll all end up as galley slaves after we've been forced to refloat their vessel or build a new ship. Slavery's bad enough but the life of a galley slave is worse than death. Amid the troubled muting, or a troubled muttering that followed, Keela came forward. That's the bad news. Now here's some of the good. Before we were herded back in here at dawn, I checked the prison pit. There's no beast inside. Martin, Feldo, and Brome have escaped. They're free. Bark John's chin quivered a little. As he patted Kila's paw. That's good news indeed. My son Feldo, a free creature. He'll bring help to us, you'll see. Aye, and Martin too, Hilgorse, the old hedgehog, chimed in. He's a tough one, that young mouse. He'll see that we get help of some sort. The slaves nodded agreement one or two of them even emitting low cheers. Bark John silenced them with a wave of his paw. Akela, was there something else you wanted to say? The young otter held a piece of sacking. It clinked as he strode about, speaking in a low, clear voice. All very good, but what are we going to do, or what are we doing to help ourselves? It's no use just sitting here on our tails making fine speeches and waiting for others to do something. Look. He flung the sacking open, and weapons clattered to the ground. Three knives, a spearhead, and four slings. I collected him from dead vermin while we were working through the battle last night. There's a start to our armory. Purslane, a mother mouse, stepped forward carrying her infant. 
She took an axe head and a broken sword blade from inside the little one's shawl and added them to Kila's weapons. I managed to get these. It's not much, but it's a start. Others started to come forward and add their contributions. This dagger's got no handle, but it's sharp. Here's the top from a long pike. It only needs a pull. I got a whip and these two arrows. The bow was too big to carry. A pouch full of sling stones, a sling, and this iron hook. A hedgehog, a little more than a baby, tottered out and threw his offering onto the small pile of armaments. A dagger and stones to throw. The otter, called Tulgru, began gathering them up. Well done. We best hide these until the right time comes along. I'll bury them in the earth underneath my pallet. Hilgorse nodded approvingly. Good work. Remember now, stick together, help each other, steal anything you can from Bad Drang's creatures. Each day, my friends, we will become stronger, more determined. Only our bodies are held in slavery. Our minds and hearts are free. The meeting ended. Tulgru began burying the weapons. Drop the bankful pretended to be sleeping, but he was noting through half-closed eyes the spot where Tulgru was digging. Slave beasts snuffled and moaned in their slumbers. The fire burned low in the crowded compound, and stars in the soft, dark sky loomed down on, or looked down on the misery of the wretched creatures below as they slept. All save two. Keela was still watching Drop. Dawnlight found the small boat had been carried far out by the ebbing tide. It bobbed about on the heaving gray waves like a leaf in a storm. Feldo, Martin, and Brome bailed with paws and oar blades, trying to splash the water over the sides. They were fighting a losing battle. Rose stood in the stern, straining her eyes for a sight of land. All she could see were mountainous gray-green waves wherever she looked. Grum sat miserably, blocking the leak with his bottom, bailing with his little ladle as the boat settled ever lower in the water. Burr, hoy, I can't swim. It be a shame to finish er, it be a shame to finish up drowned. Something struck the side of the boat, causing the timbers to creak. Brome looked up from his bailing. I hope that was a rock or, or something floating by. I hate to think it was a big fish. Rose peered down into the water. Her eyes went wide with shock. She looked up, pretending to scan the horizon. Her brother shook his head. Come on, Rosie, you can't fool me. I saw you gaping into the water. What's down there? It's a big fish. Rose's voice was little more than a whisper. They stopped bailing. Feldo chuckled half-heartedly. Big enough for us to catch and eat? Rose shook her head. The other way around, friend. It's big enough to catch and eat us. There was another thump against the boat's side. Grum sat tight, staring uncomfortably at the sky. Burr, I hates to think of me poor old bottom a poking through a boat with the girt fisher swimming under I. The fish struck again. This time it fractured the planking, and seawater squirted in as the boat settled lower. Martin grabbed an oar. This will make a good float, Feldo. You and Brome hang on to that other oar. I'll take this one with Rose and Grum. If we get separated, we'll meet up at Noonvale. Look out! Here we go! The boat filled up, seawater rushing in over the sides as it dropped from beneath them, plummeting into the depths below. In an instant, they were all in the sea, struggling and kicking out as they held on to the oars. 
Submerging his head, Martin gazed down into the depths. He could dimly make out the gigantic shape of some deep-sea fish as it chased the sinking craft into the greeny depths. As he pulled his head from the waters, Rose was shouting, Brome, the feldo over here, can you reach us? The young mouse and the squirrel were being swept away on the crest of a big roller, whilst Martin's oar was being pushed under, weighted as it was by three creatures. Instantly, Martin released his hovel on the oar. It bobbed up and began traveling away from him on the waves, and he struck out after it. Rose paddled madly, turning the oar so it would drift nearer to Martin. Grum helped as much as he could, calling out, oh, Martin, swim o'er here. See if and you can catch a hold of my paw. Painfully, Martin came fractionally nearer his friends on the oar. Rose kicked back with all her might to hold the oar from being swept off, and Grum stretched himself full length in the water. The sun began breaking through the windswept gray cloud masses, bringing with it a heavy summer rain slashing and hammering on the faces of the deeps. Half-blinded and spitting seawater, Martin felt his outstretched paw come in contact with Grum's foot paw. He clung on furiously for dear life as Rose cried out, Hang in there, Martin. Just tread water. I'll relieve the weight on this paddle. When I'm tired, I'll change places with you. Rose kicked out with the waves, sending the oar skimming along through the rain-washed sea. Feldo had his mouth open to the sky, trying to drink in some rainwater. Brome had heaved himself up on the oar. Anxiously, he scanned the sunny storm-swept wastes. There's no sign of them. The waves are too high. Before Feldo had a chance to reply, the water beneath them heaved, and they were both lifted high into the air. The big fish had hauled the sinking boat around like an empty pea pod. It had found something to play with. Its huge body buffeted and banged the boat about. Feldo was still holding on to the oar as the fish temporarily lost interest in the boat and charged the oar. The squirrel saw the wide mouth gaping through the water. Rows of pointed white teeth and a cavernous pink interior whooshed through the sea towards him. Feldo let go of the oar and submerged. He felt a thump on his back as the giant creature seized the oar and made off with it, frolicking and leaping, sometimes half its own length above the surface. Suddenly it dived and was gone. The hull of the upturned boat struck his head as Brome leaned over and seized his ears. Gotcha, matey! Scrambling and kicking, Feldo managed to haul himself onto the upturned keel, where Brome was clinging with all paws. Phew! That was a close call. Still, fair exchange is no robbery. The fish can have the oar. We'll keep the boat. Feldo wiped dashing rain from his eyes. Let's hope that monster doesn't feel playful again and come back to the boat after he's chewed our oar up. Hang on to my tail and steady me, young'un. I'm going to take a look around for the others. With Brome clinging to his tail, Feldo stood gingerly and surveyed the stormy scene. Sunlight shafted down through the cloud masses which were showing areas of bright blue sky between them. The wind whipped the wave tops into white foam, sending massive rollers combing across the main. Any sign of them? Feldo shielded his eyes from the rain with a paw. Not a glimpse, but there's a dark splotch on the horizon that must be land. It must be flood tide, or headed straight for it. Brome was not sure whether it was the rain or tears in his eyes. Thank the seasons for that. 
I wouldn't become a seafarer at any price. Leave the water to the fishes, I say. The morning wore on, but the rain showed no signs of abating. Grum clung to the oar, half asleep, with Rose hanging on to his footpaw. Martin paddled doggedly on, pushing the oar in front of him, his body numbed from the cold of the sea and the driving rain. The sun was now coloring the sea in glorious tints. Rose stared at it through salt-rimmed eyes, lost in its beauty for a moment, until Martin's voice cut into her reverie. The sun sets in the west, doesn't it? Rose nodded. Hmm, I suppose it does. Martin's voice became suddenly hoarse with excitement. This is the eastern sea. If it were morning, the sun would rise on its horizon. Don't you see what that means, Rose? I'm too tired to work it out, Martin. Tell me what it means. It means that we have to face inland to see the sun in the afternoon. So if we can see the sun in front of us now, we're traveling towards land. Rose came fully awake. Hauling herself up on Grum's back, she gave a loud yell. Land! It was distant, but it was definitely land. Dark cliffs showed against the sky. She patted her mole friend's wet back heartily. Land, Grum! It's land ahead! I won't believe it until your digging claws can scrape it, Missy. And then, if it be so, this your beast won't never even be caught drinking water again, never mind his swimming in it. Martin found renewed strength and kicked out harder towards firm ground. And that is the end of chapter 9 of Martin the Warrior. Next time, we'll be reading chapter 10. But I'm going to close the book for now. Uh, as always, I like to just remind people that if you enjoy this reading, uh, it's worth getting the book, checking out the series. Uh, there's lots of Redwall books, maybe 20 or more. Uh, they're great reading for um, kids and, uh, you know, sort of tweens, even young adults maybe, um, uh, or even adults with a, you know, still kid at heart. Um, and the audiobook, the official audiobook version of Martin the Warrior is really excellent as well. It's got a professional cast of real actors with genuine British Isles accents. Uh, and it's narrated by the author, Brian Jakes himself. Uh, it makes for a great listen. Uh, so thank you very much for joining me for this chapter of Martin the Warrior. Um, plan to have another one of these sooner rather than later, uh, as I've promised. And uh, I look forward to having you here next time. Have a good night. Bye for now.